Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ben Sigelman. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO here. It's a real pleasure to be uh, hosting everyone in person and everyone who's streaming online as well. I know you have a lot of things you can be doing with your time, and I don't take that lightly. We'll try to make this uh, at, at very least entertaining and hopefully useful as well. I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to talk about today at, in broad strokes before we get into it, and, and I'll also just explain in a couple of sentences what LightStep actually does, because uh, it'll, it'll take a little while to get to that part, and I don't want people to be like, wait, but, but what, but what? So uh, I think it's important, the market that we're serving is dealing with a pretty significant transition, and I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about that. This isn't about talking about the TAM and how much money there is or anything like that, but just literally technologically what's happening and why, and what problem is that creating, and at a very basic level, what sort of, what category of solution do we need in order to understand that? So that's the first section which I'll be presenting. Um, we are going to follow that with an overview of our actual product, which is going to be very much about the nuts and bolts and interactive demos and so on. And Dennis Chu, our director of product marketing, will be running that. And that will be followed by my co-founder and CTO, Spoons, whose uh, birth certificate says Daniel Spoonhauer, but I've never heard anyone call him Daniel except at Starbucks. Um, the uh, He'll be going over the architecture of the product, which is actually pretty interesting and I, th I think will, will be a fun discussion. And then I'll follow that with a conversation about where I see uh, the entire space going in the future and uh, at, uh, at a conceptual level and, and it's also some problems I have with the way that we've been talking about it uh, in the in the larger ecosystem, the way we're talking about um, the problem space around observability. I'll talk about that. So I think it should be fun. Um, I was told uh, I'm on strict orders not to pitch or anything, so I'm, I'm really not, we're really not trying to pitch here. We're really trying to explain and have a conversation, certainly welcome interruptions from anyone in the room or by proxy anyone who's not in the room. Uh, it would be great to have uh, interactive, an interactive discussion here. Uh, with that said, uh, LightStep, basically what we do is uh, we make it easy for people who run large, complex software systems to understand how the systems are behaving. That's usually something that they care about when they're doing root cause analysis during an incident for firefighting or when they're trying to make things faster in the steady state um, or when they're just trying to get a grip of literally what's happening in production, what talks to what, um, how do things depend on each other, that sort of stuff, which sounds simple, but as we'll see, is actually getting harder and harder. So those are the sorts of problems that people use our product to solve. And most of our customers, in fact, I think all of them still have a monolith, but they also have some investment in microservices or serverless or uh, whatever you want to call it. But they're moving away from a monolithic architecture. So that's kind of where we play from a platform standpoint. Um, with no further ado, I think maybe I'll get started. Uh, sound good? You good on the AV front? Cool. Right, so let's talk about uh, moving away from monoliths. So there's a dream here that people have when they do this, and there are a lot of nightmares and some implications of those nightmares, and that's what this segment's really all about. Uh, I already introduced myself, so I won't uh, do it again, but, uh, but I've been thinking about this problem for a long time. I was at Google for nine years, in 2003 and 2012, and I spent most of that time working on Google's large-scale distributed monitoring solutions. So that was Dapper, which is their distributed tracing system, and Monarch, which uh, was a pretty significant project, but we didn't write anything about it, so it's not very well understood. But you can think of it as like a wavefront or, or Datadog or signal effects for all of Google. And, uh, and I, I have a lot of uh, uh, scar tissue from deploying those things across Google. And that's informed the experience here and will inform the discussion that I'm about to lead in this presentation. So first I want to talk about microservices and why people are doing this. So this is sort of the vision, right? You've got this idea, I think, when you move to microservices that you're going to have these independent actors, in this case uh, represented by these um, uh, starlings that are sentient, separate entities that are managed by their own teams and together they're greater than the sum of their parts and it's independent and agile and scalable and beautiful and elegant, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what people are kind of buying into, I think, when they get excited about microservices and the decoupling that comes with that. The reality often feels a lot more like this, um, where uh, you feel like you're frankly out of control and you have very poor visibility into what's going on. Um, this is, uh, at a high level, um, what's happening uh, when people migrate away from monoliths. They have a, a lot of problems, not just with visibility and monitoring observability, but also with 
you know, CICD and testing and deployment, the whole works. So LightStep doesn't try to solve all those problems, be clear, but there are a lot of problems that are associated with it. And when we talked with the market when we were starting the company, we heard this type of stuff in spades. Typically, the blog posts that we write as an industry focus on things that are going well. We actually had an event here a month or two ago uh, where we had people come in to talk about all the challenges they've had, which is much more fun, actually, <laughs> than talking about how well things are going. And there are a lot of challenges in doing this. And LightStep focuses uh, uh, on challenges relating to system understanding and visibility. Um, this is a, a basically we had one of those talks was this uh, uh, the senior VP of engineering at uh, Databricks, VJ Gill, who's an awesome engineering leader, gave a talk about uh, the only good reason to move to microservices, which was basically uh, that you have no. Are people familiar with Conway's law? Uh, well, just, just for those who aren't, Conway's Law is this idea uh, that was proposed by a programmer in the 60s, I believe, that a system, uh, a, the architecture of a system will end up resembling the communication patterns at the corporation that produces that system. So that is to say that you're going to ship your org chart. You might not like it, but you're going to have to have each team ship their own piece, and those pieces are going to uh, take the same form as your organizational chart within your company. And this is really what happens with microservices. You have no choice but to do this. I think Vijay's point was this is a law for a reason. It's not something you can really avoid. It just has to do with communication patterns. And that the biggest impediment to software development is the fact that you can't get, um, you, you can't get around the fact that, that more than 10 or 12 engineers working on a single project doesn't really work. And so when you have hundreds of engineers working on a monolith, that really doesn't work, profoundly doesn't work. And I saw that at Google myself. And when I started there, I was uh, you know, fresh out of college and I was working on the ads front end, which was just like a sort of st standard JVM monolith, 2003. And there were a couple hundred of us working on that. And it was just an absolute log jam. And indeed, they had to break into pieces and so on and so forth. The, the term microservices literally didn't exist at that time, but it was something that just made intuitive sense. And that's why people do this. Um, this Quickly draw uh, three pictures. So here's a monolith. Uh, there's some kind of transitional state, which I'll, I'll just make small because I don't want to use up too much real estate. And then you have like the full microservices reality. So I think the idea is that you have the software monolith. Let's just imagine that your staffing is fixed. You have you know order of sort of 100 to 10,000 developers, uh, that's when this stuff starts to really, really fundamentally break down. And you realize that's not working, so you split things off, your monolith is getting smaller, and you transition by having a constellation of microservices around this monolith. And then you eventually want to get to this point where the microservices are all very small and can be uh, scoped to a single purpose and are in incredibly easy to deploy and scale and so on and so forth. This is the sort of vision that Amazon is propagating with Lambda or the fast stuff. Like That's what people are getting at, I think. Uh, and of course, there's a continuum here. Um, I think my big observation is that uh, from an organizational standpoint, this actually does work, literally work, in the sense that the goal here is that if, a, if these two services happen to depend on each other, um, uh, it's probably true that the, the human beings on this team need to talk to the human beings on this team. And you're all good, because it's OK for a team of 10 people to talk to another team of 10 people from time to time and establish some sort of understanding of, of what the API is going to be and things like that. So, that all works perfectly well. I think the, the place where you end up getting into trouble is the fact that this service also talks to that service, which also talks to that service. And in these microservice architectures, although your team only really has a human relationship with this team, there's an implicit dependency on anything downstream. And as these service architectures get to be larger and deeper, rather than just having a diagram, a system diagram that looks like you, know, you have some kind of router with a bunch of services underneath, the customers and prospects that we see, this thing goes way down. And at Google, by the time I left, I'm sure it's, <coughs> it's more than this now, but, but honest to God, between the front end that took a Gmail request or whatever, you know, pick your favorite Google product, and an actual, it was still a microservice running, if you wanted to make a big IOOP on the kernel, there was a service called D that was a disk service that you would call to do that. The, the number of 
of, I don't mean the number of services, but literally the number of levels of depth to get down to D was like order of like, you know, 30. It's not like three or something like that. And that's the world that I think we're moving towards. And so the trouble is that you have this managerial problem that you solve by having human relationships to deal with adjacent services, but the system itself gets much, much, much more complex. And your actual dependencies are your transitive dependencies. And that's not something that you can solve uh, from a management standpoint very easily unless the tooling is, is also uh, adapted. And, and that's really, that's the problem. That's the pain point that, um, that happens here. So this is, uh, uh, we're gonna get into tracing, which is the other half of this presentation, but um, microservice transactions feel like Rube Goldberg machines in practice. It's not because people are bad programmers, it's just because it's really difficult in this environment to understand the implications of your API calls that you're making, and things can get very hairy. Um, this is my favorite tweet of all time. We replaced our monoliths and microservices so every outage can be more like a murder mystery. This is, um, Right on, like right on. And it's not, um, uh, it's one of these stranger than fiction things where we actually, it's funny, you know, De Dennis will present a demo app that we spent, uh, you know, a couple of sprints like building this demo app just to demonstrate how microservices really work uh, and how they look. And we tried to make it realistic. And still to this day, our own actual system generates in my mind, much more realistic data than we can ever get out of the demo app. It's really hard to engineer, intentionally engineer things as complicated as what happens in, in reality in production. And, and it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's good in a way for me as a business person, but it's, it's very difficult for the market. These systems are very complex. I'm sure people here are familiar with that, but I can't emphasize that enough. And this isn't just Google and Facebook. This is something that we see really anywhere that people have gotten to a point where they have more than 15 or 20 services. You start having these failure modes. Are people with me so far? Making sense? Too fast, too slow? So this is a pictorial version of, uh, or a slide version of that picture on the board. So here's your monolith. It gets broken into packages or whatever, and your, you know, your teams in a monolithic world own their library that gets linked in statically to the monolith and that gets deployed. This breaks down for managerial reasons, it also breaks down for computer science reasons. I think a lot of people read you know, papers from you know, the Google papers and stuff like that and assume that computer science is the reason to do microservices. It, it's there, but it's mostly about management. This doesn't work from a management standpoint. So you split it out and you have, ultimately you end up with services that roughly correspond to the library that you were statically linking before. The trouble is that if you had a transaction that took some path through your monolith, that transaction still needs to go somewhere. In everyday transactions in microservice environments, and this is actually not complex enough to really illustrate it. I mean, um, our, you know, our customers that are further along this journey, they're regularly generating everyday transactions touch 100 services. It's not like it's very profoundly distributed. And um, this is just... Like the, it's a categorical breakage. I think there's a lot of talk about transition to cloud and, and transition to VMs before that. I think that the transition to microservices is more akin to the transition we had in the late 90s from when you bought software, you went to Babbage's or whatever. I don't even remember what the place is called anymore. But you'd go and buy a Photoshop box and it had a CD in it. And then we switched to a model where you bought software by, you know, or use software, even if it was licensed, by using your web browser. This is more like that transition, I think, in terms of the architectural implications. And the tooling that worked before really doesn't work anymore, and it's kind of fundamental. It's not like an issue of a new UI or a new data source. It's a different type of transaction, so I think we need different tooling. Real quick question, the F in FAAS. Oh, sorry, functions, I, this is my way of saying serverless. I, I will rant for just a minute. I think serverless is a terrible, terrible term and we should all stop using it. Let me tell you something that's serverless. Peanut butter sandwiches are serverless. Um, so are chickens and clouds. Like it doesn't mean anything. It just like everything that's not a server, it doesn't mean anything and so it frustrates me. So I say functions as a service and then no one knows what I'm talking about. So maybe we should just call it serverless. But, but this is my way of saying, Functions as a service, serverless, whatever you want to call it. I think serverless as a marketing term is great, um, and it gets, it gets you in the mindset of getting away from having to understand Etsy, init, scripts, and all that kind of crap. Like, I get that, but as a way to explain what it is, it's just incredibly confusing. It's, it's, second, well, it's, it's tied for first with NoSQL, same problem. NoSQL could be, you know, anything <laughs> that's not SQL. <laughs> anyway, um, good? Sorry for the rant. Hopefully it's entertaining. 
so they're distributed. They're also concurrent. So this is the way that we tend to think about transactions in our head. It's like, okay, yeah, there's a transaction, then another one, then another one. Um, in practice, they're concurrent, so these services have to handle things concurrently. Uh, in practice, again, they're concurrent and async, where you don't want to just block while you're waiting for a service to come back. So you go and do other work and then come back to it. So things are all split up. But in microservices, it's that, but worse, where it's all of those things, but it's also split across many actors. It's not three, of course. It's more like a couple of hundred. And you need to find this transaction. You need to find a way to say, I want to isolate that particular story. Because really what we need to be able to do is tell stories about these transactions. If we can't do that, there's no way to make sense of these systems. And, uh, and that's not about light step or anything. That's just a fact. Like, if we can't tell a story about a single transaction, we, it's just a non-starter to understand these systems. And, uh, and that's difficult. So yeah, I mean, this is basically what distributed uh, traces are. A distributed trace is basically that red line on the right. It's this idea that you're going to follow a transaction as it crosses from mobile to server and from microservice to microservice, and you're going to tell a coherent story about what happened to a single transaction. That's what this type of tracing refers to. Uh, the, um, the basic idea is pretty simple. You need to look at all requests and all services, or at least consider them. Connect the dots, so if service A calls service B, you need to understand that that happened, and then you have to derive some sort of insight from that. And uh, there were a number of academic tracing systems that were described in the 90s, and I think maybe arguably earlier, if, if depending on how you want to measure things. Um, in, two, in the 2000s, Google had to productionize something like this, which I worked on with a number of other people. Um, we wrote a paper about that, which was rejected from every conference we ever sent it to. Uh, and then at some point, someone else at Google wanted to cite it. And they're like, Can you, what, what ever happened? Where did that get published? I'm like, oh no, no one wanted to publish that. Because it's actually not a science paper. It's just an engineering paper. There's no hypothesis. You can read the Dapper paper. It just like, describes how we built this thing. There's, we're not really testing anything. So the scientists were like, this is not science. And I was like, that's fair. <laughs> it's not. Um, so we put it online just because someone wanted to cite it, uh, just as a technical report at Google. And it actually has gotten a lot of attention since then, which is surprising to me. But, um, but you can look at that if you want. It describes a very vanilla distributed tracing system that was done kind of in a hurry in order to solve an urgent problem at Google. Uh, uh, there are many other ways to build distributed tracing systems. And one of my big messages for the day is for people to understand that what we did with Dapper is fine, but it's actually probably the simplest possible thing you could do, and that there are a lot of other things we can get from this data beyond seeing, seeing a single trace at a time, which is what Dapper was designed for. Uh, and what makes tracing difficult to deploy? Um, tracing instrumentation is too hard. This is the number one problem. I think a lot of times when, you know, this actually came up, I was getting together with some people before we really started the company who were implementing tracing at a number of uh, pretty aggressive microservice-oriented organizations, and, and we were talking about all the features we were building and, and so on and so forth. And then at lunch and at drinks, all we talked about was the fact that we couldn't get, well, well, I wasn't at an organization at the time, but they were all talking about how they couldn't get developers to actually instrument their code. And so no one could use the cool analytical features. Instrumentation was the problem. And so a bunch of us got together and started this project, which I'll talk about in a second, but the things that they, these are the requirements they had. You can't lock into a vendor, including an open source project, because you're changing your code. So you don't want to hard code your visualization system into your code. So you need to be decoupled from that. Uh, you can't monkey patch. So even in Node and Python and, uh, and Ruby and PHP, it's possible at a language level to monkey patch the system, like kind of like an agent. But that doesn't really work. Go ahead. Can you define what monkey patching is? Yes, absolutely. For everybody so, else, I know exactly. No, no, that's a great question. <laughs> monkey patching. Um, <laughs> <For friend. yes. laughs> monkey patching is when you hire a trained monkey and you put them at the keyboard and then see what happens. No, it's, it's when you have the idea, the, the, the term monkey patching is obviously a little pejorative. It's because as an engineer, you want to be using clean APIs to make changes to your code. And monkey patching is when you decide to not be so clean. And in languages like Python, PHP, Ruby, JavaScript, et cetera, it's possible to not change the code, but change the behavior of the code from the outside. So you say, I'm going to write code that's going to say, well, listen, I don't care what the programmer actually said. We're just going to interpose. When they say they want to call the service, I'm going to say, oh, no, no, actually, before you do that, let me interject and do some accounting and change the bits and change what's going over the wire and then hand the control back to you and hope nothing broke. And when it doesn't break, it's very clever because the programmer doesn't need to do anything, but it often breaks and it's really difficult to maintain. So um, in general, it's thought of as a, 
is like almost automatic code debt where you're going to make this change. It's very elegant in a way because no one needs to know about it, but it's going to break someday in a way that no one's going to know about until it happens. And so it's sort of frowned upon in my mind. And so the developers that I was speaking with didn't want to pursue this approach, I think for good reason. Um, uh, it's also very dependent on the internals of projects. So rather than relying on their API, you rely on their implementation, which is almost definitely a bad idea. And then there's also a lot of interoperation, handoff woes. Distributed tracing is distributed. So everyone in your entire architecture needs to agree about specification level things like how you, what the data model is and how you can describe things, et cetera. And that's, that's hard to do without some kind of rigorous effort. So this is what open tracing was for. We actually started a project called DCP, which stood for Distributed Context Propagation. That didn't sound very good, so we called it open tracing. I was checking my time. I'm doing okay. Um, this works for uh, uh, developers who are building kind of quote unquote cloud native microservice applications. Um, it's also helpful for people maintaining open source software. Uh, uh, it can be anything from uh, an Express, uh, like Node Express or Drop Wizard in Java or Django and Python, those sorts of frameworks, to people maintaining uh, databases, to people maintaining things like Cassandra. Um, those sorts of projects benefit from having tracing built in natively, and it can also benefit people who create uh, tracing systems or monitoring systems because they only have one API to bind to and then they can get coverage of many different things. So open tracing is really an API standard. It's not, um, to be clear with Lightstep, it's not some open core thing. Uh, Lightstep is not built on top of open tracing like, um, oh, I don't know, what's a good example? Like Confluent is built on top of Kafka. It's not a lot of IP. It's just a standard that's used to make developers, open source package authors and vendors uh, program against the same API, which has benefits for everyone. So it's more of a marketplace type of thing. Um, speaking of the marketplace, this is actually out of date at this point, but it's very well adopted and there are a lot of places where it's being used. I think there are some languages that have been added since this slide was made and definitely some vendors that have been added since the slide was made. Um, but the idea is that if you use any of these things, open tracing is supported and it's a very light API and so it's not difficult to add more support for you know, vendors or languages or, or projects. Um, the benefit of this is that this tracing instrumentation problem, which I was referring to earlier, gets a lot easier when you have a standard you can program against. Um, so I did want to say a quick aside, which I get all the time, um, does Lightstep require open tracing? Not at all. In fact, a lot of our customers don't use it, which is completely fine with us. The reason that we're doing this and the reason we're investing in it is kind of twofold. One is that I just care about it, like personally care about it, and I think it's good for the industry. And the other is that this is an accelerant. The, the pain point around tracing is so profound that it's actually decelerating the migration to microservices at the industry level, and Lightstep benefits if that transition happens faster. So open tracing has been adopted by our largest competitors, and in some ways you could see that as being bad for Lightstep um, because you know, we have no lock on this. It's completely vendor neutral. Um, I think that's great. I just want to see the industry move as fast as possible in this direction. It's going to get there eventually. I just want it to happen quickly. So Lightstep is investing in open tracing because we see this as something that's good for the industry and moves the industry more quickly towards modern architectures. Um, but we don't actually depend on it at a product level. We are, uh, we're pretty omnivorous about data. Uh, and then my last little segment here before I'll hand it off to Dennis and you can actually see what Lightstep does in more detail is who cares about this. So um, hipster companies, I've tried to find a picture of a hipster online. It's the best I could do. Um, they care about this stuff for sure. They're usually founded you know, within the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, they're early adopters for sure, but they're also early inventors. They actually write a lot of the systems that people adopt at larger enterprises um, and make meaningful non-bug fix contributions to open source. Um, Lyft is a, a great example of a company that's created some awesome open source with Envoy. They put that out into the community. They don't make money off of that, but they needed it for themselves and then open sourced it just for all their usual reasons, and that's great. Um, they usually left monoliths years ago, not completely, but they started migrating years ago, so they're a bit further ahead in their transition. Uh, and at this point, a lot of these are big brands with real businesses. So this isn't to say these are startups. I think a lot of these companies are public now and are doing really well and have you know big, big headcount, but they still have this culture that they're uh, unafraid to do things that are on the bleeding edge. Um, and interestingly, we also see enterprise. I tried to find a picture of a modern enterprise on the right. Um, uh, the um, uh, 
the thing that's really interesting here, when we started the company, this is the biggest question I had about who needs this stuff. This is actually, um, it's been really interesting. The, the enterprise, uh, despite my sort of joke on, with the picture, is quite sophisticated about this. Like they, um, I think Pivotal has done a great service to the industry by getting in there and helping people establish practices that go along with the architecture. But in many ways, they're doing things in a way, they're taking advantage of their centralized control to do things in a really intelligent way. I think there is a really strong leadership at a lot of these companies and they can make they can, they can apply standards to their organizations in ways that can be difficult for companies that are much more anarchic. And so they, um, uh, any company that's becoming a software company, I don't want to say that's everyone. I think it's a bit of a, I think Mark Andreessen is on the right track about software eating the world, but there's still companies that are not software companies that are just going to buy software from other people, and that's fine. But a lot of companies, certainly anyone doing anything online, uh, even as part of their business, need to become software companies and employ developers. Once you have a couple hundred developers, you run into this managerial issue, and you have no choice but to move away from monoliths. I actually don't care if we call it microservices or fast or serverless, but the move away from monoliths is inevitable uh, if you have a lot of developers, or they're going to become incredibly unproductive. And that basically introduces the pain point I described. So I think it's important for me to communicate in this format that LightSup isn't really betting on any particular winner in microservices or serverless or whatever. I think what we are betting on is that complex software is here to stay and that that's going to require something that's capable of understanding many different communicating entities um, working in concert to do everyday activity. Uh, yeah, so I think... Um, that's pretty much it. These are the things that people typically have trouble with and we'll talk about in the next segment. Uh, finger pointing around latency and reliability is a big problem. Public outages are a huge problem and can damage a brand permanently. I mean, I've seen that happen a number of times and you want to avoid that by detecting problems before they become um, severe. Uh, anxiety around deployment is huge with a lot of prospects we talk with. Um, cost for logging systems has become prohibitive, which I'll talk about later. And uh, cost for metrics also becomes really difficult when you start trying to get really fine-grained and use time series data to measure everything. I don't know if you all have seen that, but I'll talk about that later too. And uh, the signal to noise for metrics and logs is actually really poor if you can't understand the distributed context. So that's the stuff that we usually see. Um, I think we need precise measurements, which we'll talk about. Rapid hypothesis <coughs> testing, which is another way of saying root cause analysis. And global context, or you can't make sense of these modern systems. And uh, with that, yeah, I thank you for paying attention. Uh, any questions before we proceed? Well, I have a quick one while oh, he good. sets up. Yeah. That Go. previous slide where you showed language support, you said a couple other languages were on the list but not on the slide. Yeah. Do you know if Elixir offhand is on that list? That's a good question. Um, so there was an effort. Um, some people in the Erlang community created open tracing uh, library kind of of their own accord, and they it didn't get... It wasn't part of the open tracing as a GitHub organization, and there's an open tracing contrib GitHub organization. I think it's an open tracing contrib, but hasn't been um, like when we want to. We we don't want to create. An, if you create an API that's unstable, that's really bad for a lot of reasons. So we try and make sure that the APIs are super stable and. Uh, and I don't think that one's been vetted yet. The, the ones I was thinking of, I know Lua has been added recently, and Swift was added recently as well, I think. Okay. Yeah. But uh, Elixir, and I, I guess I shouldn't say it's the same thing as Erlang, obviously they're different, but those, there, there is a lot of effort that's been put into that stuff, but I'm not aware of the current status of the API. 